Welcome to the Werewolf Lectures. The Werewolf Lectures is a series exploring the history, cosmology, and cultural impact of the werewolf motif and myth in popular culture. The Werewolf Lectures began shortly after I created a documentary called Hunting the Hound of Cold Hollow, based on research into a werewolf legend I had discovered while working as a freelance writer in northern Vermont. I was surprised by how quickly that short film gained popularity on the web and was inundated with questions and comments from viewers. So to address these topics, and many more, I began the Werewolf Lectures in 2019, hoping to take a deeper look at the history and scholarship behind the ongoing conversations around various shapeshifters, dogmen, and other cryptozoological phenomenon. So if you're ready for a deep dive into these topics, settle in and subscribe as I continue to examine all things werewolf, from ancient mythology to contemporary popular culture, as well as several of the most compelling werewolf sightings to occur here in the United States. Today I'd like to share with you some of my research into one of the true classics in the genre of werewolf literature. Of course I'm referring to the appropriately titled Book of Werewolves by Sabine Baring Gould. Originally published in 1865, the Book of Werewolves provides readers with an overview of various werewolf legends from across Europe reaching back into antiquity, beginning with the infamous myth of King Lycaon, who attempted to test the omnipotence of the god Zeus by serving him the cooked corpse of Lycaon's own son. Following Baring Gould's exposition on the Greeks, he dwells on werewolf myths centered mostly around northern Europe and Scandinavia. He then proceeds to discuss the resurgence of European interest in werewolves during the Middle Ages, recounting several prominent werewolf legends from the time, such as the story of Bisclavray, which was written in the early medieval period, where a werewolf becomes permanently trapped in his wolf-like form due to his wife's treachery. Baring Gould's summary of Bisclavray and other such tales have since served researchers as valuable clues that have enabled further werewolf research. One of the most interesting of those clues can be found in Baring Gould's brief discussion of Irish werewolves, which are recorded in the same accounts that provide us information about the famed Saint Patrick. In addition to providing a historical and literary background to the werewolf motif, the Book of Werewolves also provides two chapters on several cases of cruel murders and other savage attacks on people attributed to werewolves. One of the most controversial of those cases is that of Marshal de Ritz, a case which Baring Gould believed was so significant that he dedicated three entire chapters of his book to the charges and investigation as well as the trial, confession, sentence, and execution of Marshall. Based on the accounts of Marshall's crimes, however, it seems that Baring Gould may have tortured the facts to fit the case into the context of a werewolf story. Based on a closer reading of those circumstances, Marshall appears to have been more akin to a vampire and echoes the events detailed in several other cases of cannibalism and blood drinking from the period. What we now know, however, is that these crimes, attributed to werewolves by Baring Gould, appear related to the ritual practices of certain sects of Kabbalists and other Central European occult societies during the late Middle Ages and Renaissance. Interestingly, there has been a significant effort taking place in France today to rehabilitate Marshall and others who confessed to and were convicted of cannibalism and other savage crimes. But perhaps what is most interesting about the Book of Werewolves is not the tales of werewolves themselves, but the sermon featured in the last chapter of the book, which seems to indicate a sincere belief in werewolves on the part of Baron Gould. Before going further, it might be of value to give a more complete picture of just who Sabine Baron Gould was himself. He was born in 1834 in Devon, England, and later attended Cambridge University before becoming an Anglican priest in 1864. Now, for those of you who may not know what an Anglican is, Anglicanism is a form of Protestant Christianity. In many ways, Anglicanism is to England what Catholicism is to Rome. And for a time, Anglicanism was the official religion of England, and the King of England was, in essence, the Anglican Pope. In the United States, Anglicanism became known as Episcopalianism, due in part to the problematic associations with British monarchism. As a priest, Sabine Baring Gould worked with many common people throughout Devon and Cornwall to create a book of folk songs published between 1889 and 1891 as Songs and Ballads of the West. As part of that work, Baring Gould became most famous for writing the song Onward Christian Soldiers, a Victorian-era hymn that became very popular amongst Northern Irish Protestants and Americans. Although much of Baring Gould's work is conspicuously rooted in his Anglican piety, he was also engaged in a variety of scholarly and academic projects, including participating in archaeological excavations of prehistoric settlements in England. He was also a prolific writer that published over 50 works, including a multi-volume set of the lives of the saints. Beyond his religious text, he also wrote a great deal about medieval history and literature and was especially interested in the sagas of the Icelanders. For many today, however, he is best known for his books on the paranormal, 
In addition to his famed book of werewolves, he conducted a great deal of research into the supernatural, and in 1904 published A Book of Ghosts. One of the most fascinating aspects of Baron Gould's treatment of werewolves is that he is clearly a believer in the existence of werewolves. In his introduction, he recounts a time when he was visiting Vienna on a trip to examine what he describes as a druidic relic. He then goes on to report how his guides, including the mayor of the village where he stayed, told him about a creature called Lugaru, which they described as being as big as a calf with eyes glowing like marsh fires. This was my first introduction to werewolves, Baron Gould writes, and the circumstances of finding the superstition still so prevalent first gave me the idea of investigating the history and habits of these mystical creatures. In this passage, it seems that he is declaring his skepticism using terms like superstition and mythical to describe the werewolves his guests believe in wholeheartedly. But then, in the very next paragraph, he goes on to detail his research, saying, I must acknowledge that I have been quite unsuccessful in obtaining a specimen of the animal, but I have found its traces in all directions. The traces are indeed numerous enough, as though perhaps like the dodo or the denormus, the werewolf may have become extinct in our age. Then again, in a later passage, he writes, Yet again, who knows? We may be a little too hasty in concluding that he is extinct. He may still prowl the Abyssinian forests, range still over Asiatic steppes, and be found howling dismally in some padded room of Hanwell or Bedlam. Here, where he mentions padded rooms, he's referring to the Hanwell Asylum, also known as the Middlesex County Asylum, and the Bethlehem Hospital, founded in 1634 and later becoming infamously known as Bedlam. What this seems to indicate is that Sabine Baring Gould, a well-educated and deeply religious man who, like many Victorians of his time, including Charles Darwin, were acutely interested in the natural sciences, saw no logical need to distinguish between scientific and spiritual phenomena. But how does he account for werewolves as a priest or as a scholar, historian, or archaeologist? One important historical point worth considering is the fact that most of those who we consider to be the founders of modern science were, more often than not, deeply religious people concerned with all facets of human experience, not just machines, gadgets, and medicines. In fact, many of the world's most influential early scientists were members of the clergy. Their curiosity about the nature of reality is what drove them to explore the spiritual in the first place, and later drove them to explore their world beyond the confines of religious dogma. To these scientists, there was no question that didn't deserve an answer. Sadly, science was steadily integrated into the service of industry, with the goal being to increase the wealth of the industrialists rather than increasing knowledge for the edification and benefit of humanity as a whole. For that reason, we have come to conclude that questions categorized as spiritual or paranormal are not worth pursuing, while questions that have been categorized as material, matters that can be applied to business or mass production, are not only more important than non-material questions, they are the only questions worth pursuing at all. Many Victorians, including Charles Darwin, and a great many others, did not see the logic in driving an arbitrary wedge between questions of matter and questions of spirit. Therefore, when the ancient belief in werewolves and vampires began to reemerge in the late 19th century, men like Sabine Baring Gould felt those questions deserved answers. Perhaps the answer was that those who claimed to have seen werewolves were suffering from a mass delusion. Perhaps they had been exposed to an environmental toxin that caused them to hallucinate. Or perhaps the creatures reported to be werewolves were in fact real animals that had been miscategorized. There could be any number of explanations, but there could be no explanation if the question was never asked, or, as it were, ignored by those who only sought to build a better machine. Even if werewolves and the like are purely figments of the human imagination, is it not worth asking why people would imagine such terrible creatures? Is it not worth learning what it is about the werewolf that has resonated with people all around the world since the beginning of recorded history? If you think those questions are worth answering, then a good place to start is with Sabine Baring Gould's classic, The Book of Werewolves. Thanks for listening.